What's up students in YouTube, this is Mr. Holsey. Today I'm gonna to talk about reverse engineering, why you wanna do it and how you can do it well. As you notice, I reached a milestone since the last time we shot this video, we shot videos. Uh, I am at 101 subscribers, which means I only need 899 before I can monetize and feed my family. Um, so first we're gonna talk about what is reverse engineering. It's the process of taking something apart and figuring out how it works. We're going to talk about structure and function and actually the visual design of something as well. Why is it used? For these four reasons, I want you to write these in your notebook if you're in my class. Documentation, discovery, investigation, and improving the product. Documentation is important if there is none already. And also if you want to make something interoperable, meaning you want it to make sure that it fits in with other pieces into the larger system. Like think about a car. If in my Kia, I've got probably uh, a few dozen manufacturers that make all the different pieces and they all have to work together. Um, also, if you want to do maintenance on any big system like that, you'd have to um, know how it's how it works. You have to have that documentation. Next, discovery. Science always leads engineering. By the way, math leads science. Um, and so if we want to discover things about science, like particularly natural systems, we've got to take them apart and figure out how they work under the hood. Um, also, military and commercial intelligence, if you want to figure out how the enemy is doing their um, devices, you want to take them apart and discover them. Investigation is really important in the event of big catastrophes like this Hyatt Regency collapse in Kansas City in the 80s. Um, this was, at the time, the most deadly mechanical failure uh, in the history of the world. Uh, I think it killed, um, let's see, how many people did it kill? 114 people and injured over uh, 200 more. And the reason that it collapsed is because of a very subtle design change um, that the structural engineer uh, did not reject um, after it was proposed by the manufacturer of these tie rods that hold held up the two levels there's some really cool videos on that i'll put the links in the description um, for videos explaining those i think it's really really interesting um, also you might want to improve or redesign the product for efficiency reliability manufacturing techniques all of these other things and i'm sure you can think of several dozen more um, here are some tools mainly we want to be able to take the thing apart and measure it and figure out what it looks like and what it does and how things work inside it and here are the big three stages um, i've kind of already talked about this in class but i definitely want you to write these three down i'm going to go through them in this order, visual analysis, analyzing why things look the way they do, then functional analysis, understanding why each particular component of a product is the way that it is, and then structural analysis, making sure that things won't break when we use them. Uh, first, visual design elements. I did already talk about this in class, so if you're watching this for class, you can skip this part, but there are eight elements um, that go into a visual design. You should probably learn something very similar in an art class or um, in other, Scenario similar to that. Uh, elements, just like in chemistry, is what make things up. So um, chemical elements make up chemicals and material world. Uh, the visual design elements make up designs. All right, and these are the eight um, main ones, and they kind of break down from here. Point, line, color, value, shape, form, space, and texture. Points are just basic um, one-dimensional elements, so they don't have two dimensions like a line, or they might have no dimensions as well. Um, can be described by coordinates on a plane used to indicate a location, also used to indicate connection. Okay, so when you see points like angular things connected, like uh, the joints in your body, that, that indicates um, things coming together. If you see points in a, in a visual design, it's supposed to symbolize um, connection. Lines symbolize lots of different things. Okay, they symbolize lots of different things depending on the type. Vertical lines represent strength, right? Something is holding something up, um, like a girder or a beam or a column. Horizontal lines represent diversity and calm, uh, calmness and, and uh, unity, right? We're all in this together, we're all on the same plane. There's no difference in, um, in social strata. Diagonal means action, right? We'll see like somebody is moving towards the heavens maybe. Uh, and then curved lines represents freedom and breaking out of a mold or something like that. Vertical lines, here we go. Strength, uh, like the Empire State Building, ben Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. Any kind of big skyscraper is meant to be imposing and powerful. Horizontal lines, look at this church in Kansas City. It's got a big awning saying, look, you can come under my wing um, and I will protect you. We'll be a big family. Come in. Um, also, diagonal lines uh, like this. 
this uh, temple here. It's like I said, moving up towards the heavens, moving towards God. Things are going on. Things are happening. Curved lines um, is, like I said, freedom, soothing. Uh, the Sydney Opera House is majestic and flowing, right? It, it's meant to look like waves flowing um, and, and being free. Colors. Each color has its own meaning, and I'm sure you can think of lots of different interpretations of them, and they all kind of fit together. I asked my class, what green means and why the artist would paint these tutus green. Uh, and somebody said snot. I think that kind of fits. Snot goes, uh, it comes from the body and um, it therefore symbolizes life, right? So life, um, like verdant um, material plants, like uh, the grass and the trees, all of that is life, all of it is vibrant and youthful and young and springy like these girls in the dance. Uh, colors have these properties and many, many more. You could spend a long time talking about different, col uh, different color properties. Hue is like which color it is, value is how bright it is, and saturation is how much of the color is present, with, whether it's very, very saturated or very gray and, and um, muted. I, don't, I was about to say boring, but you can use you know absences of these elements and properties uh, for different purposes. Also, another cool thing is color temperature because um, not only are, do these colors show up in hotter things, um, but also the wavelengths of these colors are shorter, meaning they have a higher frequency, meaning they have a higher energy. And so they will actually uh, have more heat to them. Value is about how bright it is, which kind of goes back into the color of it. Um, but value could be considered its own thing, how bright the overall design is. Um, and then it also is important for shading and gives us some perspective in our 2D shapes. Speaking of shapes, um, there are three main types. You should definitely write these down, geometric, mechanical, and organic. And um, some of them are kind of a blend, like this. these robotic pieces here. It's a blend of organic and mechanical to make this android a uh, little humanoid type robot, right? It's mechanical and it's got um, all of these, you know, different appendages, but it's also smooth and organic to make it look more biomimicry, make it resemble bio um, pieces more closely. Uh, form is the equivalent for shape, but in 3D, okay? 3D is form, 2D is shape, um, and lots of different forms can represent lots of different things. Um, the pyramids are imposing and stable. And then uh, this over here, Pearl Tower, is meant to symbolize opulence, meant to make you think of actual pearls, okay? The rich people. Space. Um, <clears throat> space it can be talked about in positive or negative, according to positive space and negative space. Basically, positive space is what's happening in the foreground, and negative space is what's in the background, okay? So if you have an image like this, you've got positive space being this ball and negative space being this background. Positive space is the tables in this image and then the negative space is the floor down here. You can also have open and cramped space. This image, I like this a lot because um, inside this building, I guess it's some sort of dojo or something. Um, it seems a little confined and cramped, but but it's um, it seems to be leading you out into this open air this more open area. So it's got a combination of both. Texture, you've got smooth textures, rough textures, and all kinds like fluffy, uh, and and they are used for various purposes. Rough, you know, somebody's got a rough exterior. This is uh, some sort of park. They want it to be, you know, playful and rough and tumble, whereas the Disney Concert Hall, just sort of like the Sydney Opera House, is, is flowing and smooth and beautiful and majestic, okay? Um, next, principles. Uh, there are seven principles. Just like there are eight elements, elements are what what um, things are made of, what designs are made of. Principles is how you put those elements together, okay? What you've got to keep in mind when you're putting them together or what you've got to break whenever you're putting them together to be more creative. Um, so the first one is balance. There are three main types of balance, symmetry, asymmetry, like I said, breaking the principle of balance, or radial symmetry. So all these things are are nice and balanced. The Taj Mahal um, is, is neat and tidy and and symmetrical according to this line of symmetry, this line of symmetry here in these gardens, it's neat and symmetrical. Um, asymmetrical is meant to show a imbalance of power. And one object um, in Moscow is more, one building is more powerful or more important, more imposing than the other. Radial symmetry is anything extending out radially from a center point. 
Um, emphasis can happen in many different ways for many different uh, with many different elements. Like this is um, symbolized, or this is emphasized here. This piece of the ceiling of this building is emphasized by these vertical lines, right, pointing sort of at it. Also, this guy's gaze is pointed at that object as well. The color stands out for sure. The texture even. I mean, all of this is rough, and this probably looks like a ceramic mosaic of, of some kind. Over here, this person is standing out because uh, the tone, the, the value is contrasted. Um, the dark versus the bright. Also, you can see this line. One more thing is that it, it sits on the rule of thirds. If you break an object up into thirds with two lines and two lines, those intersection points is where your focus is going to show up. Um, that's a photography, um, basic photography principle. Also, uh, emphasis is sort of, um, it can happen in, like I said, for several different reasons. In this, in this example, it's uh, really the color and the texture, and also uh, the fingers are pointed at it. Your eye all automatically, subconsciously looks at what a hand is holding. If you've got an image of a hand, um, I was about to say contrast is very similar to emphasis. Contrast um, could be just contrasting two different things with not necessarily an emphasis on one or the other. So these are dif um, differentiated by texture, color um different patterns maybe some unity going on there in a little bit uh there's some contrast between the people and the rest of the diagram rhythm is any repetitions okay repetitions over and over again you've got regular rhythm random rhythm which again is a break in the pattern of rhythm gradated and graduated are very similar regular rhythm you've seen patterns since you were in kindergarten random rhythm um is like we like these eastern or slavic um these architecture here these onion domes uh, showing up in random patterns, but they're all still in the similar in a similar vein. Also, right here, it's, it's sort of like discombobulated, disorder, disunity. Um, we we like that random rhythm in certain scenarios. Gra gradated rhythm is when something is increasing or decreasing gradually. It could be the size, it could be the color, or something like that. And graduated rhythm is uh, very specific. I think it's when things uh, become closer together or further apart as space moves on. Proportion, you can see um, different things in proportion. You can see the scale, you can compare relative sizes to things, that happens um, quite a lot, different proportions. And unity is really important too. If you've got a college campus, you want all the buildings to have the same uh, elements in them, the same brick, the same color, um, the same style of windows and stuff like that. It makes things look unified, it makes it look uh, like a coherent system. And economy is one of my favorites. This is all about minimalism. This is where all of our uh, logos are going to these days. We're trying to make minimalistic logos that really capture your attention and aren't uh, overly stimulating, overly busy. Um, so whenever you, whenever you look at your product, whether it's um, a spray nozzle or a, uh, a remote controller, you want to be thinking about the elements that this thing uses, right? We've got some points, uh, we've got some radial symmetry going on here. You wanna think about all those things. Um, and you wanna think about how these elements are put together in terms of principles, which principles are being used to put together each of these elements. Now, when you fill out this sort of visual design matrix, there's no way you're gonna be able to fill out everything because maybe um, value doesn't really show up that much. Maybe it's mainly just the contrast and colors. So you might skip some of these things, um, but you wanna fill out of, as much as you can here to understand what people are going for, what the designers are going for visually. Next, let's talk about functional analysis. Functional analysis is all about um, what is going on um, and why things are put in uh, certain places, like um, you know this little um, that little stopper right there will serve its own purpose. And this is the time in your reverse engineering why you th when you think about why those things happen. Uh, it's important to think about simple machines, simple machines. But I'm sure at this point, hopefully, if you're in um, high school, you've gone over this, or later, you've gone over this several several times. Um, simple machines. You are going to, in my class, um, tell me the simple machines and what they all do. Um, but it basically goes down to work. Work um, is equal to the force times the displacement. And those two things have to be parallel. That's actually um, a thought product. I believe it might be a cross product. But um, the force times the displacement 
whenever you're pushing something or pulling something and it's moving if it's not moving it doesn't it's not displaced anywhere so the work is zero anytime you move something like um this this electric scooter uh if you move that up with your hands it's going to take a lot of force to go that distance but if you spread the distance out um it's going to be a smaller force because the work isn't going to end up being the same the displacement is the same that uh, electric scooter starts at the ground and ends up in the back of the car um so the displacement is the same but it's remember displacement is not path dependent you can take other paths so the work will stay the same the work is what's balanced and you're gonna if you tweak the the displacement make that bigger that product will stay the same if you decrease the force and that decrease in force is what you're aiming for by using all these simple machines so um you tell me what a wheel and axle is and how you can decrease forces or increase forces if you want to produce power maybe um increase or decrease forces with wheels and axles and you should be able to uh, think of at least four examples uh four examples of gears for that's which is a specific type of wheel and axle for examples of a pulley for examples of a lever um also with when you talk about levers you want to talk about um the types of levers the the classes of levers there are three of them and you can talk about the resistance force the effort force and the fulcrum force okay uh, effort would be me trying to lift something up out of this lever and this is the resistance the weight of it it's what i'm trying to lift up um inclined plane and uh wedges and screws which are types of inclined planes so if you understand those really well you could start working on this functional analysis the three uh excuse me the several steps of functional analysis first you want to you want to talk about the product's purpose overall what does the product do why was the product even created in the first place that's the purpose next you've got functions functions are things that it does what does the what are, what is one of the things that the product does okay so this thing was designed to um water my plants or help me water my plants what does it do well um it's it squirts water from a hose okay um it also changes the um shape of the the jet coming out of the water right it also decreases um it also stops the water sometimes whenever i let go of the handle it also decreases the amount of force that i have to put on the hose um in order to start and stop it it also holds um the uh the handle down so i don't have to cramp my hand okay those are all different functions but the main purpose is to water my plants um next you can think about each product as a system of inputs and outputs i love thinking about things in terms of functions that shows up in math that shows up in computer science that term function you've got inputs coming in and outputs going out so think of a big machine um a black box machine we don't know how it works in there but we're spinning some stuff in okay like we're spinning uh we're we're putting in wood like blocks of wood and then chug 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 it works and it spits out paper or it spits out a chair Okay, um, something's going on in there, but we don't know at this point in functional analysis, we just want to talk about what's going in and what's coming out. So there's the purpose. The purpose of a toothbrush is to clean your mouth. Okay, prevent gum decay. That's that's a good thing. Uh, these things are being used in conjunction with the brush. You don't really have to talk about that when you talk about purpose. Um, over here, uh, when you talk about function, it's best to have an annotated sketch. You want to sketch your product real quick. Um, one, to get the idea of its basic shape down, and then also you can label each piece and what those pieces are used for, the functions of all those pieces. And see if you can, um, see if you can like I said, this helps you decrease the cramp. See if you can identify each piece with its particular function, okay, each part of your product. This is what I was talking about, the black box system being a big function, a big machine that takes in inputs and produces outputs. Here are the inputs, the motion of your hand, the toothpaste and the water, okay, those are things, those are physical things that, that you put in, but hand motion can be another thing. Energy goes in also when you are moving your hand, also maybe it has a battery sometimes that's taking energy from the battery. Um, other things, teeth, <laughs> you know, teeth need to go in there too. Um, saliva needs to be an input. And, and it does all of its magic and then produces all of these things, namely the clean teeth and gums at the end, and then the spit, um, heat and sounds, and um, I don't know, maybe a tickling sensation as well, and several other things I'm sure you can think of. All right, next, let's talk about structural analysis. Structural analysis is making sure that things won't break. In order to do that, you really gotta talk about material science. 
There are people who use this, who study this for a living, material science. It's a really cool branch of uh, materials, structural and mechanical engineering. I enjoy thinking about these. Um, as a warm up, I want you to kind of think about however many materials you can think of, as many materials as you can think of. And um, if you're with somebody, try to see if you can beat them. So if you're in class, try to see if you can beat the other people in class. Um, to list as many or name as many materials as you can think of. Okay, so here are the vocabulary words that I want you to um, write down if you're in my class. Ductile, brittle, stiff, tough, strong, and hard, and we'll go, I'll show you slides of all of these. Um, you definitely want to know the four classes of materials as well. Metals, ceramics, polymers, and composites. I see those four types in a lot of different places. Some people break them down into um, other categories as well, but those, those basically cover all of them, with composites being kind of the miscellaneous category here. That would probably include your wood and stuff like that. Polymers are um, mainly plastics. Plastics, um, petroleum-based products are going to go into your polymers category rubber and, and all of those uh, other things too. Ceramics are anything that's fired, okay, or anything um, that starts from clay maybe or anything that comes from the earth besides metals. Metals um, are self-explanatory if you know a little bit about chemistry. Here's a really cool chart. This is toughness versus strength. Oh wait, those are the same thing, all right? Mm, not when it comes to material science. Strength is uh, a product or materials resistance to a materials resistance to deforming, okay? And toughness is a materials resistance to breaking. So if I have a rubber um, bracelet, I can stretch it so it's not very strong. It's it's don't, definitely going to um, it's definitely going to deform when I pull on it, but it's very tough because it will take a lot of time to actually break it. Okay, so rubbers are over here, tough but not very strong. Think about um, whenever you think of steaks, you use the word tough, right? It squishes, but it's, it's hard to tear it with your teeth sometimes. That's a very tough steak. Strong is something that won't deform. Um, I like to think of hard and soft woods in here. The hard woods um, will not really get dense in them as much, but if you're nailing something in, like if you've ever worked with a two by four, most of the time it's Douglas fir, a type of pine. Um, if you accidentally miss the nail and you hit the pine, Two by four with your hammer, it's going to leave a dent. Um, and that's because that's a soft wood. Soft wood will leave a dent. That is a deformation in a weak material. Okay. So brittle is something that deforms before it breaks. Okay. So it's, um, it is more uh, tough than strong. Okay. It deforms before it breaks. Like you've seen a lot of metals, especially uh, when they're heated up. Are, are close to molten, they will de they will deform and stretch out. That's how you can um, form wire, okay? Brittle is anything that breaks before it deforms, anything that breaks before it deforms. You see over here, a cup and cone fracture versus a brittle fracture. This is um, a metal that was pulled on a tension tester until it broke in half. And then if it's a brittle metal, then it's gonna have this kind of fracture where it's very um, straight and rigid. Cup and cone fracture will start to will happen because there's a ductile uh, bending to the metal, and then it has a suction in the mid in the inside of where it actually breaks, and then you get that cup on this side and the cone on the other side. Um, so this one is ductile, this one is brittle. Next, you got something that's stiff. It, if it's stiff, it resists deformation. Um, that is sort of the definition I had for uh, strength as well. Um, they are very very similar strength. Um, you can say it resists both deformation and failure. We'll get there in a sec. If anything that's stiff resists deformation, right? Um, so if you have, you know, a piece of paper, it deforms a lot, it's, it's floppy, but then when you cast it in, um, in paper mache, it becomes more stiff. Okay. Um, if you've got something that's, that's wobbly and it goes stale, it becomes more stiff. Okay. Um, if you've golfed, if you ever golf, you have stiff, um, shafts in your um, golf clubs or more flexible shafts and you want each depending on different purposes right um, so stiff resist deforming or bending uh, oh by the way this is really cool um, this plywood you can mold uh, very thin sheets of veneer like that 
Um, the, the very thin slices of wood is called veneer. And if you have just one, it's very flexible. But then when you glue a whole bunch of them together, wrapping around the mold of something like that and glue a whole bunch of them together, then it becomes very stiff and a lot stronger too. Tough is, like I said, it was just failure. It was just breaking. So the rubber stuff, flex tape, yada, yada. And then strong is sort of resist both deformation and failure. Um, hardness is about being scratched or dented. And that's similar to strength too. So I'm, um, I wouldn't get too caught up in the weeds here. I would uh, mainly stick with this graph. And then if you want to get deeper into material science, you'll see all of those and you'll get um, a stress strain curve in the next um, course of engineering, POE, principles of engineering. And those will be, that'll be a really cool way to, um, to differentiate all of these. Uh, I really like this video. Um, I can put the link in the description to this one as well. It's got very nice animations. So if you're watching this and you made this video, please show me how to make these animations. They're so cool. Okay, so um, when you actually take apart your product for reverse engineering, let me know in the comments if you want to see me take something apart. Um, like this doesn't work anymore. I'd love to take it apart and show you all the different parts in there and maybe even model them and in, in, in or something. Um, but when you take something apart, you're disassembling it. This is the fun part of reverse engineering. Um, it uncovers how it works. It's always fun, but uh, nothing will be accomplished if data is not collected. You, got, you really got to slow down when you do this. We use a product disassembly chart like this um, in this engineering class. So. Um, you want to think about the name, the quantity, yada, yada. You can pause the video and read all these things. This is your material properties. This is your functional analysis. And this is the function of each product, too. Um, so, yeah, you definitely want to slow down and write all this stuff down. Um, especially, you want to, um, when we get down here, you'll see a, lo a, long step of, a long list of steps of how you want to disassemble products. Um, and you definitely want to do that. I can't tell you how many products I've taken apart thinking, oh, it's so fun to get in there and see what it looks like on the inside. And then I'm stuck here with 20 pieces of my washing machine. I have no idea how to put it back together. I have to buy a new one. That sucks. So you want to go slow when you're taking these things apart so you can definitely learn from it. Um, why do we want to take things apart? That's kind of what I talked about at the beginning of this video. We want to analyze it basically and understand it. Um, you want to be able to answer all the following questions and that's going to be part of this assignment. You're gonna to wanna to answer all these questions when you take this apart. Um, some tools, anything that basically unscrews something or, or takes something apart and measures something. I do have a radius gauge in class, so that's gonna be really cool, really fun to use when we model all of our reverse engineering products. Scale protractor, anything that helps you analyze the pieces. Um, here's the procedure. I'm not gonna go through every single thing, but definitely read through this. Um, the main things are observe and measure each part and, and create sketches. Like I said, slow down and make sure you know what's going in where and how to put it all back together. You can, if you want to, create these um, these displays here where you are putting each part on these, this poster board um, and then talking about what each part does and how it all fits together. We are just, in my class, going to uh, 3D model all of the different pieces um, and then we will basically have this on our portfolios. Okay, we'll have that on our portfolios. Here's references for this segmentation. Um, this appendix is really, really cool. I, I can put the link to this um, presentation in, in the description as well, but this appendix has basically any fastener that you can think of, anything that connects multiple pieces together. Look at this, bolts, types of bolts. Uh, so many. I've never heard of half of these. Sheet metal screws, lag screws, nuts. I mean, you could study this stuff forever. Types of washers, pins, keys. When you turn something, it locks. Um, joining metal in different ways with rivets, which are not meant to come apart. Metal rivets, spot welding, soldering. This is joining metal together with heat that will bond it. Adhesives um, like glues and epoxies, yada, yada, yada. Okay, these are all for plastic. Snap fits are very, very common. The plastic was made to deform a little bit, made to deform a little bit. So you can see this snap, it snaps in there after it's being actuated a little bit. Um, so most of the most of your plastic products are gonna come apart with snap fits here. Cantilever snap fits, that's the one that we just showed. Torsion snap fits, um, sort of like a uh, clothespin. Annular snap fits, lots of different snap fits. A press fit, again, uses deformation. A living hinge, this would be um, a box, like a little Tupperware container. It's meant to bend a little bit so it comes out. Um, bosses, hot gas welding, all kinds of crazy stuff. So if you see anything that doesn't quite fit, um, you can look through this list and see if 
your particular type of fastener it shows up here somewhere oh i love carpentry wood fasteners is, are so fun to think about you got all kinds of joints oh man there's so many different kinds of joints i really like dovetails um all of these i haven't really done a lot of carpentry but i'm really interested in getting started uh you can use these little dowels or splines to fasten things together obviously nails lots of different kinds of nails lots of different kinds of nails and tacks and screws and lots of different glues and that's it so that you should have for um references because that's pretty much anything you can think of so have fun taking apart your products like i said slow down and uh make sure you're documenting everything the way that we've got it set up here i hope you have a really great evening and like i said have fun being good engineers